Um, well, this, this memoir, um, it's about uh, one woman's 30 year journey to find um, true love and it's won six awards. And now the book is on its way to becoming a movie filmed around Bontoc and in the Hamptons. Um, it was recently featured in July and August editions of the Montauk Sun, the 27 East, and uh, Dan's papers. And the um, couple were featured on 92.1, Lunch on the Deck with Bill Evans and Je Jessica Ambrose this past July. Um, Geraldine uh, is a, um, a motivational speaker and leverages her skills uh, as a top performing market executive um, and lives in, in Montauk um, and as well as on uh, Connecticut. And without further ado, take it away. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Um, Steve is our host. He's from the East Hampton Library, and we're very, very happy to be here. Uh, this is not my husband, but he's very <laughs> sweet, and my husband did step in. So I'll be showing pictures in a little while, but my husband's name is Mark, and this is Ante, who came in um, really in a spur of the moment to, to help us understand a little bit how we convert a book into a screenplay, and so we'll be asking I might be asking you some questions too. I'll have some answers. Beautiful. <laughs> so um, the East Hampton Library usually hosts an author event. It's a huge fundraiser that I was trying to get to participate in. And because of the COVID, um, they had to transfer everything into a Zoom talks. This particular uh, Zoom talk is really for authors. And I think it's a great idea that the libraries kind of opened it up um, for other authors, not just, you know, New York Times bestselling authors and such for their fundraiser, but it's, you know, everybody's kind of switching gears over to working with the Zoom um, technology uh, in place of book signings. And I'll give you a quick little story. The week when the, the COVID was going, uh, that week in March when everybody was alerted, that was the week I had uh, book signings at Barnes and Noble and at Lord and Taylor in Scarsdale, New York, which was right next to uh, New Rochelle where the National Guard had stormed. So mm -hmm. needless to say, Steve, nobody showed up for that <laughs> book signing. <laughs> um, but we're really hopeful. And, and actually that's a great segue to what my story is about. It's about faith and it's about knowing that you're being guided somewhere deeper. And when these things or tragedies or traumas or something might happen to you, you know, where do you go? And that's my question I put out there to the reader, you know, where do you go? And for me, it, it, it was, you know, for me, it's God. And for you, it could be something different. And in my opening of the book, I have an introduction. It's about a page and a half. And it really points to the fact that faith is the overall theme. Yeah. Did you get that from the book? Completely. Yeah, thematically. Completely. So it doesn't really matter what your particular faith may be. And especially in the times of today, with what we're dealing with, it makes me very sad, actually, because people are losing hope. And one of my biggest passions, when something very miraculous happened to me and has to do with my ring, there might be a little bit of spoilers, so I'll, I'll try not to give too much away. But uh, the, the book reads like a novel, and I actually won an award for romance and fiction, you know, and I'm like, this isn't not, this isn't fiction, this really happened to me. So um, we're excited to share, share that. But first of all, I also want to tell you that we are sitting in Montauk at the Gurney's Star Island Yacht Club, where we, uh, we bring our boat every year, well, we have the last past year, two years, and we've been um, graciously gifted the opportunity to sit on this beautiful yacht hosted by, let's see, um, Staten Island Yacht Club. And Mike Fine is one of the people that, you know, allowed us to come on board because of the lighting and, and being on the water. You can see us rocking a little mm -hmm. bit. It's, it's not special effects. It's no, we're really rocking no. right now. Um, so, like, right, let's get on with it. What is Geraldina and the Compass Rose? Where did we come up with the name? I want to give you a little education that the compass rose is actually the symbol. And the symbol is of the east, west, north, and south. It's a nautical sign for direction. And in the middle, I don't know if you can see, in the middle, it looks like a rose. And so the story starts off 
with um, me explaining what Rose means in my life. And my grandmother's name was Rosaria and her last name was Gentile, G-E-N-T-I-L-E. -E. We, we pronounce it Gentile. Um, and those of you who are familiar with the Bible, Gentiles were like a big part of uh, time of like conversion and stuff. So my grandmother came from Italy and when I was a little girl, I grew up with her. My mom and dad were young 20 somethings, married and had two kids, my older brother and myself. And we lived with my grandmother for the first nine years of my life. And my grandma came over from Italy on a boat to Ellis, from Ellis Island over to Bridgeport, Connecticut. And she went into the convent at a very, at a very young age. And obviously she got out of the convent because here I am today to <laughs> share the story. But she met my grandfather and married and was very spiritual and religious woman. And she had a devotion to saints, the Blessed Mother. Um, and uh, she, she had this great capacity to love. And in, in the story, it is a, a romance story about how I meet my husband, but the roots of the story come from the fact that I, I was brought up with this, this uh, incredible faith. And my mom carried it on and it, it was part of our family. But my grandma was Italian and she came over and she had her own, um, she settled in the Bronx and had a grocery store and she saved her money and she moved up and out and built houses and, and stuff. Anyway, you get a feel for my grandma when she had her ho house coat dress on and, and she was a widow. She used to pray a lot and she had her rosary beads in one in one pocket and she'd have her handkerchief and a dollar for me to put away in her <laughs> other pocket and we'd be making the meatballs saying the rosary Geraldine she would say you know you want to say the rosary so I learned to say the rosary through the example of my grandma now my friend over here Ante is from Croatia and he shares stories about some similarities in his family right yeah faith was yeah the yeah. statues yeah and, yeah, a lot with the saints and a lot with the statues. Grew up in the faith. Uh, my grandmother was very kind of spent summers back there. Uh, born and raised in, in New York, but would go back to in the summers. And uh, very, you know, the whole idea of faith, you know, whatever that is individually, you know, what makes a person special sometimes is that inner, inner quality. Uh, and it just kind of comes to the surface in that person in the form of joy, laughter, wisdom, sharing. Uh, there's a generosity that comes of the spirit, you know, well, when faith is really there, whatever, it's believed in, in a bigger picture. Uh, and kind of that's what attracted me to the book, because I think it speaks volumes to a deeper sense of faith, regardless of where you are in your life, regardless of what faith you're from, regardless of what background you're from. It just speaks a larger volume of faith and something greater than yourself uh, and a belief in that, that uh, kind of guides you unknowingly once you open yourself up to it. Anyway, that's what attracted me to the book. I'll let Joe then speak more to the characters in the book and the, and the conflicts that come with them. Right. So, so that was part of the attraction also for us when we met Auntie and how it happened. Actually, we didn't have to search. He just showed up. Yeah, I just I was standing there. <laughs> <to be> there. <laughs> Which is, that's kind of, that's, so that's what you're going to find inside a journal. So the compass rose, we'll go back to just the idea of the name of the book and the metaphor around it is that my grandmother is the rose in the center and she's the guide. And, um, and, and that's really the, the symbolism of faith for me and how, where the, how the rose comes into play, the actual physical beautiful red rose or pink rose in my case, um, it, it has to do with a, a saint named Saint Therese. And she is actually, there's a Catholic church up here in, in Montauk and that's where I went on my first date with my husband, Mark, but the book. So something very mysterious happened in um, my life when I had turned 30. And in the story, we, we take you from, I take you from, I, I do jump around as I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so it opens when I'm 30 years old, but you'll get the backstory on when I was a little girl with my grandmother and how that faith was instilled. And then I share these other stories that have happened to me along the way, uh, that 30 year journey of searching for the right person. So I always thought at, you know, at 20 years old, it was kind of what the way we were. Um, 
a young woman, you know, your ambition was to find a mate and get married. And so it was, it wasn't something that I had pressure from my parents or anything like that, but it was, it was like this underlining tone that, you know, that's what was meant to be. So, you know, I went to high school and I graduated and I wanted to go into uh, college, but the idea was still in the back of my mind, you know, who, who, who's the one? And you're out there as a 20 year old experimenting and meeting new people and having boyfriends and such. So we, I, I share the orig original, um, you know, first time career moves when you move out of your house. And then when you get that first job and, uh, you know, when we're looking at a, a screenplay, I, I'm always thinking, you know, what is the audience going to gravitate towards and relate to and all those emotions that go along with the new things in life in the, in the year of your twenties. But then what happens, um, you know, my twenties were over and now I'm, I'm going into my thirties and I'm not married and my girlfriends are married and they have children. And there's an actual uh, chapter in the book called the bride's whisperers, where I tell, talk about everybody else's connection to love and how they're meeting their mates and how it was meant to be. And I was a big part of it. And there's some funny stories and some sad stories along the, that journey. But um, what really impressed upon me is something that happened with with my uh my engagement so i don't meet my husband until i'm 50 years old so now we're we're climbing into my 30s and then into my 40s and then here i am at 49 years old and i'm wondering if if it's ever going to happen and the my faith had had to carry me all the way through some of the sorrows and the uh, you know, the tribulations of, of life in general, losing jobs, being unemployed, never having children, um, and not having a successful relationship that would turn into a marriage. So we, we take the, I take the reader um, into this kind of mystical place because at 30, I had an experience with a man in an airport. And this is where I, I felt it had the appeal of a movie, part one. This is the first thing that triggered. So I meet this gentleman after I, uh, a flight was canceled and we actually open up the chapter with the man in the airport and the flight is canceled and they're at, um, everybody's up in arms about it, but I've traveled a lot and I was already a vice president of marketing for a developer of shopping centers. So I was very fortunate. I had a great job and I, decided that I was just gonna relax, go along for the ride, I couldn't change anything. I went into the restroom, changed into comfortable clothes, and right before I did that, I had eye contact with some, some man in the airport, he was like twice my age, and he said that, um, he, he just had a look about him. And when I came out of the restroom, there he was, standing there, right next to me, and he invited me for a drink. So now, I, I'd like to ask Steve if we can get a little raise of hands of how many people maybe um, read the book already, and how many people have not read the book? Okay. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Steve, you know, if you get read, put it in the put it in the chat. If, if uh, yeah, you could just say it. You could just interject and just say, you know, uh, several people have, or nobody has, or whatever. Um, if you could, sure. If, if has anybody. Um, Read, read the book. Um, I see something we new. Have it, we do have it in the East Hampton Library collection uh, for circulation. Um, we have a few, a few response. Um, not at the moment. Uh, okay. I, I haven't read the book, but I don't mind spoiler alerts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. We want to hook you on buying the book too, because uh, the the book's available everywhere, and you can go to my website gbgbooks.com to find out where you can order it at at the library, or you can go, you know, and purchase it. Um, we but, have uh, we have uh, from Jill reading it and loving it. Oh, thank you, Jill, and um, that's great. Okay, so the man in the airport is a significant p part of the whole story because he was an intuitive and he explained things that I couldn't understand anybody else 
knowing about me. Um, and we sat down for about over a course of six hours. And while he spoke to me, he actually made the circle on my, not on my hand, on the table, which had this effect that I thought he was hypnotizing me. <laughs> and, but there was something deeper I listened to thinking that, you know, pay attention, that this is an important mm. conversation. But I didn't know where he came from. And his name was Joe George from Atlanta, Georgia. So even his name was weird. And I, and I don't really couldn't define what he looked like, but he was definitely an older man. Anyway, the, at the end of this six hour interaction, he leaves me with three uh, significant messages. And the first one was, don't, don't ever lose that little girl in you. And, you know, I guess he picked up on the spirit of the way I am. I am like a little kid all the time. I still ride my bike. I still wear pigtails. I still play. Um, and uh, the second thing that he said was, um, you're going to receive a gift. And, but what, the way he spoke to me wasn't about, uh, I didn't think it was intuitively myself thinking it wasn't a material gift. It was more of a spiritual gift. He explained that his mother had this way of receiving gifts mm. with such joy. So I didn't know quite what he was talking about. And then the third thing, and of course the most significant thing that um, he left me was that my grandmother had a message for me and that she had just passed away two years earlier. And I thought, you know, I, I feel her presence. And he says, she's with you all the time. And don't worry about it, you'll know. So I leave the airport and I go home and I'm thinking, what just happened? And I take a diary out and I write in my diary, which to me is like speaking to heavens above. And, and I said, guess who I met today? I met my guardian angel. And guess what his name, uh, guess who sent him? And I wrote down my grandmother's name, Rosaria. Now, it's very unusual because I don't call my grandmother Rosaria, I called her grandma, you know, it wasn't, and, and that just stuck with me. And I felt that was a gift in itself, this interaction with this stranger. Um, and those words carried me all the way through because every time I, I met a man or I thought maybe this was the one, I had a deeper sense. And I call that my faith or the, the Holy Spirit or some spirit nudging me, letting me know that. I'm on the right path or it's time to change paths. And um, it wasn't until I met my husband on a blind date here in Montauk. And the setup was my mom's dear friend, Eunice. Um, and you know, my mom's, she's, she's been fantastic. And my dad, you know, they never pressured me. They never said, what's wrong with you? How come you're not married yet? I felt it more on my own guilt, you know, but I would get that sometimes at work or, you know, strangers, or I meet a, 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 a potential date and he'd be like, you know, what's, you know, you're not married. Like, what's the matter with you? You know, there's something <laughs> matter with you. you should be married by right, now. Right. You know, you should be having kids. Right. And meanwhile, I'm watching my, my two brothers, I have a younger and older brother have these beautiful kids mm. and I'm the auntie for all of them. And uh, I share stories about my love for people and, and how it, it parlayed into my work, into my everyday life, into my spiritual life. Um, I even have two little, here's the first visual, two little people, um, not people, <laughs> two little characters that are in my book, uh, so you can see them, Emma Jean and Frog, so I have a frog, stuffed frog and a, and a teddy bear, and uh, there are stories around that, and the, that chapter is called Emma Jean and Frog, so I do jump around, and then I, and I start pulling it back together when I meet my husband. And Eunice, my mom's friend, makes this introduction because her boat is next to his boat in Connecticut. Now, Clinton, Connecticut is where I reside full time, but I had never heard of Clinton, Connecticut. I'm from Westchester, New York, and never really went to Clinton. No, yeah. So I only knew as far as like Westport, mm -hmm. and then I knew about the, you know, the upper coast of where Mystic is. So Clinton is somewhere in between the, the, the outlets and the casino and Mystic, Connecticut. So it's about an hour and a half from New York City. Anyway, so I never heard of it. And Eunice is telling me that there's some man I need to meet who has a boat over there. And when she was at my mom and dad's house, 
at, a, at my father's birthday party, which I didn't even know she was going to be there. This was all kind of meant to be. Um, throughout the story, you'll get a lot of meant to be's. But Eunice makes this comment that he has a boat and something changed. It was like this little light came into my heart that there was hope for me. And at the time I was 49 and I thought, Kind of, I, I made the surrender prayer, like, you know, if I was going to be married, um, I had a list of 50 things that I wanted in a man, and my husband just made the height requirement. <laughs> you, want to do, you want to do a cameo? <laughs> and then if I was going to be single, I thought, you know what, I just want to have that peace in my heart. So <laughs> here I am, I heard boat, and something switched, and there was this kind of like joy in, inside of me, because I already surrendered the whole idea of being married. And, and lo and behold, um, Mark gets a, a, a text from Eunice with my information on it. And we go ahead and meet up. But what, how many, six weeks later, I get a text from my husband inviting me out to Montauk for a, um, a weekend on his boat. And we never even spoke on the phone. So you can only imagine my response. This is his. Hello. <laughs> Ready? Hello. I'm in Montauk alone. If you can make it out here for the weekend, you can stay with me. I have an extra bunk on the boat. There's tons of people around. So you, so, uh, wait, there's tons of people around that you, that know me. So you're safe. Mark. And then I say, what? Can we talk on the phone? <laughs> I'm a true beach bum and a fish, so don't put the bait out unless you're very serious. I'll call you shortly. Because I said, okay. And that's literally, in, in a matter of seconds, I thought, if his voice isn't good, there's absolutely no way. But, ha you know, there's, I would love a raise of hands, so but how many people would have taken that chance to take, you know, a total stranger up on that? You guys want to? Show Steve. No, we'll, okay. no, like, no, no. If you no. want to, yeah, any correspondence, if you want to put it in the chat, uh, okay. we'll gladly. Uh, that's, that's how, that's, that's, that, those are situations that can get you in trouble. So right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jenny says, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, I think a majority of people that when I've given the talks before, they, they are like, a few hands will go, yeah, maybe I would. And, um, you know, there are other stories about where I have the, the sense of adventure, but I have guts, you know, to go ahead. And, and I, I attribute that to that spirituality, too, that there's something pushing me to pay attention to it. And so I did. And of course, I called my mom and dad and say, hey, by the way, if I'm missing an action, um, anyway, I'm going to <laughs> My last whereabouts. <laughs> And when when he picked up the phone and called, that little leap of joy came yeah. back. Our first date, Mark takes me. I make it there in record time, which was unheard of on a, a hot, beautiful August weekend. And I drive out to Long Island from Scarsdale, New York, which at that time, at, at rush hour, it probably should have taken me six hours. That in itself is a miracle. I, I don't know, know that if there's a... anything else in the book that might come across as a miracle to you. Scarsdale mm -hmm. to all the way out to the end of Long Island. In, in three, hour. three hours. That, like, that's Moses' part in the waters <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so everything from that moment on fell into place magically and beautifully. And, um, but here's the whole screenplay part. When I sat down with Mark, I put my hand out on the table. We went out to dinner and he made this circle on my hand. And I thought, wait a minute. And I do my own flash back to Joe George in the airport. And I'm thinking to myself, like the room kind of got foggy. I wasn't really hearing what he was saying. And I'm thinking, there's something magical happening here. And it was beyond an explanation. I couldn't explain it. And, you know, Mark could attest to his side of the story where Auntie's going to pull that out in the screenplay. 
and in the movie, you know, to get a little bit of where he was coming from in his life and how he had to surrender and let go of some things. In, and I think in order for this destiny to take place, these things had to mm -hmm. have occurred prior to. So at that moment, we, we connected right away and we thought, well, you know, this is going somewhere. The beauty of it, I had just taken on a different job and I negotiated a lot of time. And in my history of work, I never took it. <laughs> and I, I swore to myself that this time, I'm gonna take the time. Mm. And as the days went on, Mark would say, you think you could take Monday off and stay a long weekend or Friday and come out Thursday night? And this is what happened. I took a total of 28 days off from the day I met Mark to the end of September. So it was August 7th through September 30th. I took 28 days off of work. Mm. Now, raise your hand if you were able to do that. That's a miracle. <laughs> and then another <laughs> miracle. I, I would call my CEO and they're like, she's like, sure, do it, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> if she's on the call, thank you, thank you, thank you. you know, but so, you know, these miracles, I would call them blessings, uh, kept on happening and just kept reinforcing the fact that this was a, a relationship that needed to pursue um, and, and continue. Then comes the part where Mark wants, you know, we know we want to get married. And it was a hands down, yeah, let's do this. Um, and, I, and I felt it was right. There was no, I, I talk about a workshop I went to and one of the outcomes was, you know when you know and you know when you don't know. And it's okay when you don't know, not really, because we're always wanting to know, but when you know, that's like a bonus, big time. Mm -hmm. So this was an I know situation. And um, so we were, we're making the plans and Mark wants to buy me an engagement ring. And what happens is I don't want one. And I think, why do I want a ring? I was waiting for the commitment. So I said, you know, forget about the ring. I'm looking for this. And he, you know, male ego was thinking, yeah, I can't let you go around. You're my girl now. You need to have a ring. And I was insistent. I said, you know, we, we have this beautiful boat, put the money towards the boat. I enjoy being out on the, the water. And um, I'm not here to show anybody anything. The commitment of marriage is what I, I was waiting for. And uh, we were out to dinner one night and some girl I ran into who knew I was getting married, first thing she did was grab my hand and look at the hand. There was nothing on it. She says, where's the ring? And my husband's like, oh boy. So he's on a hunt to have me understand what ring I want to get. And I continued to tell him, stop, stop, stop. I don't want a ring. Now here we are about six months out. We already have the wedding date. We have the church picked out. Everything's going beautifully. Um, Mark's living out in, in Scarsdale with me and we have this uh, you know we have our boat out in, in Connecticut and life was really good we're very excited so we're making all these wedding plans and Mark has pulled me aside and he's like I need you know I want to get an idea what is it you want an oval you want a diamond and I kept on very adamantly tell him no, forget it save your money and I happened to have to go to a, a store a department store at Lord and Taylor in Scarsdale and I said, hey, do you want to come along with me? Right after we had this argument in the morning about the ring. When we walked into, it was 10 o'clock on a, on a Sunday morning. We walked into the, the department store. And there is the, the jewelry, fine jewelry. I had to go pick up something on, at the makeup counter. He sees fine jewelry and he's like, let's take a beeline and go check out the jewelry. And I said, just to pacify him, I said, okay, well, this ring popped. I never even knew that the department stores would have, I don't know if you can see it, a little, little flicker here. Dee, dee, dee. Mm -hmm. You can see it's like three tiers. And Mark, um, we put our hand right over the ring. And this Italian little lady comes waddling over says, I never seen nothing like this before, opens up the casing and slides the ring perfect fit, like a Cinderella slipper. And I get filled up and overwhelmed with a, a feeling I just do describe in the book, but 
it was born on something I never could, um, I, if I, I said, if I could bottle it up and give it away, I would make billions of dollars because it was that kind of emotion. So smitten the two of them, but I happened to glance up and see her name tag and her name tag is Rosaria. And I see somebody, Marie, she's like, oh, why? <laughs> That, so you can only imagine. Mark knows nothing of Joe George and the man in the airport in my diary entry or anything like that. And here is this Italian woman. I said, Rosaria, that's my grandmother's name. Mark never met my grandmother. Um, didn't really know, you know, that much. He met my cousins and family. So you got a sense of family and how close we are and how much love we have for one another. So I walk away. And Mark, of course, buys the ring with Rosaria. And as I walk away, I'm floating on air, tears coming into my eyes, and I see the woman at the makeup counter, and she looks like she's glowing in the background. And I said, oh my gosh. She goes, ma'am, are you okay? And I said, I'm getting married. And it was like the first time really sunk in that I, the wait is over. And I, I, every time I tell a story, I, I, I fill up because only I know that, that feeling. And so she goes, um, what, are you okay? And I said, yes, I'm getting married. And, she, and I said, wait a minute, you look so beautiful. What's your name? And she said, Grace. Hmm. And that's what I took, that I was in this state of grace, of uh, a, a spiritual joy. And... Um, I, I, I find my way back to the counter and I uh, see Rosaria and, and Mark have their little smirks on, the rings all packaged up, ready to go. And she says to me, you know, you two are so beautiful together. This is what, this is what it should be. This is what it should be. And, but my daughter, you know, she has a $35,000 ring and she puts it in a drawer. She doesn't even wear it. And you two, you should go share and enjoy what, God bless you, what a beautiful thing. And I'm glad she was a part of it. And I said, Rosaria, what does your son-in-law do that he's buying $35,000 rings, right? <laughs> <laughs> and where, what draw is it in? You know? <laughs> so, she's accepted, yes. So what happened? I can't believe, so she goes, oh no, 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 no. He owns Amelia's bridal shop, let me go. I go, well, do you have his business card? And I haven't bought my dress yet. And again, how everything just fell, falls into place. I never had to ask for a thing. She said, I write it down for you. So she goes running and running and running and running. And she writes the information down. And she says, you know, tell them Carmela and uh, Giovanni, Amelia, Amelia's Bridal Shop in Scarsdale. It's only a, like two blocks from my house. You know, I could have walked if I wanted to. I was all excited. I said, thank you so much. So I turn over the business card. And it's my grandmother's name. It's my grandmother. And there she is. Can you see with the glare, little glare? And that's my grandfather. His name is Jerry as well. So that's that's Rosaria Gentilich. Working in magic. Now, you can imagine what's happening in my head. Yeah. yeah. I'm jumping around. The man told me this. She had a message for me. Knowing my grandmother, she's like, my granddaughter's not going to be without a ring. <laughs> 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 That's for damn sure. She's going to get the ring. She's going to get the guy. Uh, now, on the flip side, Mark's having a similar situation the day he invited me out to Montauk. But those are the, all the caveats in between that lead up to the story, the sorrows, the, the challenges, the, um, the, the other joys of love to be. I, I taught catechism. I have funny stories, you know, sharing my faith with the, the children and how innocent they are and how loving they are and how willing and open they are. And I hope um, when that ring happened, the, my grandmother, I knew... Mark and I would like with tears in our eyes, the romance that we had is meant for the screen. I haven't even touched any of 
we have we have taken auntie on road trips to kind of try to share and maybe you can yeah explain a little bit what you experienced yeah without the romance but he brought his girlfriend though she he's she's I have. Sure. we've experienced romance due to it uh uh you know unexpected coincidental but yeah i've been out in uh journey to a few of the spots in, in montauk there's if you play a lot of magic a lot of magic in a place like this as you can imagine just like uh ridiculous landscapes, very specific places. I am uninitiated in the ways of Montauk uh, and getting a view through their eyes has given me a deeper understanding of the characters, how it fits into the screenplay, the visuals, the tapestry involved in all this. I mean, there's places out here, I've traveled quite a bit, uh, there's places out here that we, you could liken to, you could be in the middle of Italy, you could be somewhere you know way out you don't it doesn't feel like you're connected to what would be the continent of the u.s in a way it just there's a certain type of magic in some of these places amazing amazing amazingly beautiful uh locations um and so seeing the romance blossom in a place like this kind of makes it the depth of uh what they were experiencing emotionally capturing that backdrop is uh it's kind of it's kind of poetic and at the same time so cinematic that it uh it endorses everything that Geraldine speaks of the magic the synchronicity of uh moments uh in her life individually them individually but then them coinciding in a place like this kind of uh brings up this level of synchronicity faith uh outside of coincidence everything happening and aligning in the right way at the right time um yeah so when the i i knew it needed like i just had again you know when you know and you know when you don't know and this was another i know this needs to be a movie how do i do that mm -hmm. so i kind of go through my influences the people that i know and i there's a gentleman that I know for many years. He lives in Chicago and he did some writing for Hallmark and Lifetime. And so I called him up and I shared the wow story or the ring story. And he said, Geraldine, that's all. Yeah, it's got tons of quality to it, you know, but you need to write a book first to really to, to solidify the journey and, and be able to sell it and market it. And I, I scratched my head and I was like, okay. How do we do that? <laughs> so I rolled up my sleeves. I had the time on my hands. Um, you know, life had changed after I, I was married and I, I won't give up that part of the story. You'll find it in the epilogue. And so I had this time that was granted and gifted to me in a very strange way, um, in a challenging way. And I, I was determined and, um, I figured it out. I, I read books. I, I am a movie person and a, and a one book, like I, I very focused. I don't watch TV randomly. I get a feeling for a book. I find it. It finds me. I get a feeling to what, to watch a movie. Mm -hmm. I've always picked the Academy Award winners. Always. Always. Wow. So I'm hoping that we can get some, you wow. know, real big players uh, to play it out. But, so when I got that, it took me two and a half years. Let's just put it to, to the end here. It took me two and a half years. And I worked with the Fairfield Writers Group in Connecticut. Um, they had provided the editors for me, um, Carol Downhauser and uh, Kimberly Cadwell. Magnificent. I had a writer help me structure and put together the pieces. Um, Jacqueline Burke, she's a wonderful, one, hours, hours. Mm. Um, and then I, I started learning how to really write yeah. Yeah. and I kept it and learning your voice. So that's a whole nother Zoom call. Steve, if you want to invite <laughs> me, we can talk about that. But I really want to get to what we met a producer last year in Montauk and the producer, um, my husband is, he comes from IBM and has, was in client relations and really that's his gift knows has to keep in touch with people uh, to make them feel a part of things and we kept in touch with this person that we met at random again um, at a restaurant called Josephine's um, 
and it, here in Montauk last year, and we kept in touch with them. And then also when I started winning the independent, you know, book awards, um, Mark would keep them updated up to par with what was happening. And he started doing his networking. And that's how we met Ante. Yes. Yes. And then he was like, hmm, I want to meet these people. Yeah. What are you talking about? So I'll take, let you explain how that conversation might have gone. Yeah. So the producer, Rob Simmons, got in touch. I mean, I've worked with Rob Simmons on a, on a bunch of projects. We, From Jars Productions. Yeah, Jars Productions mm -hmm. and uh, Jars Media. We've done several films together. We're, we're, we're doing several films right now that are in various stages of production from post to pre-production to shooting during the time of COVID. But, and I write, uh, I am a writer of screenplays and uh, Rob got in touch with me, told me about this book, um, kept on mentioning the book and I was very interested. I love the idea of a book to a screenplay, A, because uh, sometimes screenplays originate or start from an idea, synopsis, thematic kind of thing where someone will give you three paragraphs four pages, if you're lucky, five pages sometimes, uh, and say, go ahead, write it. And it's like, oh boy. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, you gotta write a hundred and some odd pages after that. And it's like, okay. Um, but this is where I always wanted to delve into uh, translating a book to screen because the characters are all there. It's very fleshed out. Uh, it's the opposite end of the situation. It's like, now you have all the information. Now you have to decide where you're gonna go with each piece of information, how it intertwines. And again, uh, it becomes a structural thing where you have 90 some odd pages that you get to tell this story. And so what happens, how do you translate? It's not, you know, a book can be 300, 400, 500 pages. You're not gonna write a 300, 400, 500 page screenplay. It's just, it wouldn't work. Um, so it can't break out of that structure. It's a, it's a, it's a definite thing. So now it becomes, how to tell a story visually, how to intertwine characters, uh, dialogue, um, the whole nine yards and making it happen kind of uh, organically and also inheriting, I like the mm, word inheriting, nah, I don't know if I use that word. I'll, I'll give it more thought. Somewhat inheriting the author's voice, translating it into a screenplay. Uh, and the beauty of that is Geraldine's here. It's not like I just have the book or the material to look at. I have Geraldine to work with so that the refining process of the script really uh, has her voice in place throughout the whole, the whole screenplay. And uh, it's an economy of language, I guess, screenplay, because it is visual. You know, so sometimes there is what dialogue can do and sometimes there is what the visual can do without saying anything. Um, and I think the book has a tremendous amount of the visual without having to say too much at times in it uh, that delivers the spiritual sense of the book, the faith, um, the thematic faith and tone of the book. Um, and it's an incredible journey. It's a phenomenal journey. I mean, I read it straight through in one sitting. I really, I have to go back and read things all the time. And when I first got the book, I was like, oh boy, I hope I like it. <laughs> that's, always, I that's always the beginning you know you gotta like what you do you know and i said i started it and i read it straight through which is always a great sign i was like i read this in one day um which i that's the first thing i told rob was i read the book in one day i think he knew what that meant right away like you know it any because time is always the thing to producers and writers when people are sending you stuff it's like oh you may have the time to read you know but I read it right away with screenplays, same thing. If you read it right away, it's always a good sign. And that was first off a great sign. And after that became, can, I, can we meet, you know, uh, Geraldine and Mark? Again. And sit down, you know, and kind of work with them. Um, so how does that work? Yeah, you know, and so we kind of, we all met and uh, here we are, I'm working away and uh, this is evolving and getting refined and there will be a screenplay a completed screenplay soon enough um yeah and then production happens after that so this is the development development phase of it all and taking and translating it into a into a screen format how exciting is that i'm excited about it. well and then there's you know there's so much material and timing again ha happens to be on our side believe it or not i i don't look at as the the whole pandemic is a bad thing in, in this situation for us. 
it's giving everybody an opportunity to kind of calm down and then select the scripts that they really, really want to work on. And everybody's starving to go back into production. Mm -hmm. And we're, that's perfect timing for us because it's going to get us in order with the screenplay and the collaboration. Now, we do have some other folks that we're working with that at this time, um, again, showed up. And uh, it's Diane Casa. She's a, a director and her husband um, and an actress. And her uh, she's working on an independent film right now. Um, oh boy, post production in that. And then her husband um, is David Platt, and he did the Law and Order series uh, for the last twenty years. And I don't know if David's on the call, but that would be really cool. He said he liked the book too. Hi, David. <laughs> <laughs> and hi, hi Diane, if you're on. Um, and so to have this kind of, you know, as consults or how these people that know how to take something and make it something else. That's not, I was in the marketing world. So I love the idea of this whole putting things together because that's what I did in the shopping center world. We made these big shopping malls and, and it's the dynamics of how things fit and the coordination and then the expertise has to come from, you know, finance, production, um, you know, people that know PR, people know. So you know, I bring something to the table and my husband brings something to the table too, that in this, in this whole dynamic. But I think the, the greatest thread for me is when I met Ante that he had, he could see that soulfulness that needs to be in this film. And I said, I don't care, you know, who the actresses are, but if they, they can't demonstrate that, then they're out you know, the kid, yeah. <laughs> and who am I to tell, you know, a casting person, like, I, I'm not, I'm not anybody, but I, I have my faith, and I know that it, it shouldn't be produced and let it, unless it's, it's going to put out the right message, and sure. my, my message is of hope, that you can't give up, so, um, Steve, I think we're, we're kind of wrapping it up on this side, anything else, Auntie, you want to share yeah, about your ideas without giving it away? Uh, you know, I, I think from a, from a thematic uh, point of view, it is it is it is a woman's journey. You know, it's a, specific to Geraldine and her journey, but it's a woman's journey. It's you know, it it's filled with um, trials, conflicts, and twists unseen that I think are got you because there's a lot of stuff in the book that caught me off guard. You know, in a great way, and I was kind of like, wow. Okay, you know, uh, so there's a lot of depth to the characters, a lot of depth to the life lived, uh, and a lot of wisdom from it that can be shared, I think, in a, in a lot of ways across, you know, a wider audience. Um, so I, I just, I'm, I'm kind of in the gestation part of knowing that it's something really beautiful is coming of this and uh, the storyline and uh, gravitates towards a human story relatable story that's universal you know no matter who you i found myself connected to it i don't know that i would be the target audience but i was yeah. definitely connected to the material so uh, I, have, anyway. I have one picture to share that um before we go to q a where is it okay this is i don't know if you can see that that's me at 20 something with a little girl her name is rose it's my cousin's daughter we got married the same year <laughs> okay that's that's shish that's a lot <laughs> so it is that journey and that waiting and sometimes we just want it the crystal ball and know it it's right there we want the answers but i think also that the spirits of the departed you know they're here there's there's it doesn't that's the mystery and it, yeah. i don't know what you you know you want to call it um, but if any of you have any questions, we we would love to, you know, raise your hand. Steve, is, are there any plans um, for is the book to be translated to audio? Uh, to a, oh, great! Yes, Wonderful. actually, I'm working on that right now. And um, when we were hosts, at, we were on a radio show. Um, Bill Evans is one of the um, LNG, sure. Yeah, from LNG, he. He wrote six books. Did you know that, Steve? 
him and he was the weather he does does the weather for lng but he was i believe on one of the networks 13 emmys yeah. ABC. yep so he uh he was saying to me you know what they wouldn't let me the publishers since i self-published they wouldn't let him do the audio and he's like I, I was so angry i wanted to do it myself i don't know if that's what something i would do i, I think my energy is going to be towards the second book and also the film and kind of see where that you know where that all that is going to be taking up a lot of time and energy so i'd probably hand over the project i'm just under i like to understand i actually um also had hired somebody um out of college and we wrote a screen we wrote a screenplay i wrote this i wrote a screenplay too but i only did it to get the experience and she, she's a brilliant kid. I call her 4.0 because that was her great point <laughs> And um, But she shared with me so, so that when I meet with Ante, you know, so you, you, know, you don't know all the back end work that goes into even getting to this cover. Yeah. Even getting to the back mm -hmm. script, my editors. Um, the, you want it to be ultra professional as an independent. Otherwise, you will not be taken seriously. It was like screaming and... You know, and Dennis from the library, I mean, he just was gracious to listen. And I didn't bug him, but I made sure that he knew I was serious. And then having people support you that are noteworthy, that have, you know, credibility. And I know authors and stuff. And, you know, everybody's busy. So it was a very busy world. And it was, it took a long time. But my, um, the, the gal, her name is Michelle um, from, uh, Williams Designs. Oh my gosh, here it is. Uh, cover designed by Melissa Williams Design, but her name is Michelle. She's such a talented kid. Mm. She chose this. She gave me three options on cover. And I, I gave her an idea of what the story I gave her, the book, obviously, to read. She gives me this picture, and I knew this was the one. Again, mm. this is the one. The other ones look more like a Harlequin romance. You know, it had more of that... Um, you know, kind of those series looks. Right, right. This seemed very unique and you take a chance at that. You know, it's not that the publishers are gonna like it. And at that time, I was still wondering if I was gonna query for an agent. Mm. And I won a query contest. That's a whole other story for a whole other Zoom. But <laughs> again, I knew nothing about it. So I throw myself into the unknown. And the name of this picture, I did not know until the first draft of the finished formatted. So mm. she did the color front and back. And it came in like this. And then I got the entire, um, you know, thick, you know, the book came through. Um, and the name of this picture is, it's a stock picture. It's called Searching for Peace. <laughs> now, how can you, see what I mean? Great. I'm following. watching your expressions. You're doing great. <laughs> it, it, and it was a tearjerker for me. And then my doorbell rings and it's the chamber wanting to just greet me and welcome me to the, you know, being a part of it. We joined the chamber, my husband and I, and uh, the lady comes with a rose bush as a gift. <laughs> Kid you not. Constant. And I said, please come in. I have to tell you something. And I shared this whole story with her and she was in tears and we're friends today. Anne Marie, she's on the call um, from uh, Madison, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And, and then also getting into the local business uh, bookstores, R.J. Julia, very, you know, well-renowned bookstore nationwide. People know about it. And it's the sister of, I'm sorry, Steve, what's it called out here? Book Hampton. Hampton. Mm -hmm. They manage the Book Hampton. I don't know if they are owners, but um, you know, in October, I did have a signing and a, a talk there with, before all of this went down. So th everybody's been gracious, but you have to bang on the door, you know, yeah. for, after a little while. Okay, so questions? Does, does anyone have any questions? If, if you have a question for Geraldine or Auntie, um, you could type it in the chat, or if you'd like to um, unmute your mic, um, by all means, please do. Okay, oh, she's there. Please see Diane. <laughs> Do you have like um, a a list of like a like a like a, a long list and a short list like who would be great for which part mm -hmm. in the time? Oh, for the you mean for the actual film? Mm -hmm. 
we kick around names. There's always wish lists. You, know, you create a wish list. You know, you start with you start with the biggest people. And I'm not going to hold you back from saying those names. Because <laughs> I know, I already I'm know not, who she wants no, to say. No, I'm and thinking it, we should do a contest out there and <laughs> let the world tell us who should be but, playing who. You know. Go um, ahead, put it in the chat if you have any ideas for Mel or, you didn't see my husband. I'm going to show you a We, we had a conversation about it. And I think, well, why don't we just say the names that you, I mean, Joe. Wait, hold on. Go ahead. There he is. Oh, uh, he's so handsome. Can you see? And that was us on the our way back. So, yeah, might as well just jump in. I mean, the wish list would be, you know, uh, as Geraldine shared with me, okay, me confidentially, see. Jennifer Aniston and Brad Pitt. Right? You want to start really high. <laughs> so we think you want to start with the very top. Well, and, and here's why: they're both single now. Jennifer doesn't have any children. She's in her fifties. And the whole world was in love with their love story. And if they had the guts to come back and show them that this could happen <laughs> at great. 50, and who knows? Um, you know, so, you start with that, but you know. <laughs> or Jennifer, Jennifer <laughs> Aniston and James Franco. Franco, Franco might be good. Franco might, Franco's a name that's come up a few times for a few different factors. But yes, Franco would be great. I mean, it's open. It's it's open territory. You know, Armand think, Asante. Uh, <laughs> a lot. A lot. Like Armand was in one of his movies. Yes, I worked with Armand many times. Great actor. Great guy too. Um, He's too old to play. There you go. So you heard it from the from the top. Too old. Um, but this casting is kind of a, a wild ride. You know, it it, it always depends. It's material too. You know, once you get material out, and put it we out. we have one from. Um, Franny uh, typed in uh, Diane Lane and Richard Gere. Oh, they're great. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. That's good. Richard, yeah. Who's that? Who, who's that? Franny? Franny. My friend Franny. Franny. Know, yes. Franny. Good Hi, job, Franny. Franny. She's awesome. That's a good one. So, and the other part is what, what I liked about it. Oh, I don't have that picture. I didn't bring it. Is the little girl and how, you know, I love that little girl. I had a beautiful childhood. I had a good childhood, and 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 my family. When we we were at the beach, the the, the story is so much around the beach and the water and what mm. joy that brought to me. Like so, when the that word boat happened, it wasn't that I wanted to be on a boat or right. a yacht or sure. had nothing to do with it. It was the fact that this man obviously loves the water, loves the ocean, and I want to be a part of that. And and mm. that's why the story also with the visual. It's amazing. It's I'm so grateful. You have no idea. Every day, it's sunrise, sunset, rain. It doesn't matter. It's beautiful yeah. out here. Montauk's a very, very, very special place. Um, we have a, is that's your, a, question. a question. Is your grandmother's full name Rosaria Gentile? The exact name? That was her birth name. My grandmother married a Cuomo. No relation. <laughs> <laughs> That was her name. My grandmother was a strong woman. She came back as an entrepreneur. I mean, imagine not speaking the language, going into a convent, having the courage to get out of the convent, and then getting married. My grandfather was 11 years older than her. Mm. So this is back in the, you know, 1920s something. She was born in uh, 1907, I believe, and came over in maybe at, at 12 years old or younger than that. Yeah, it was like my great grandparents, you know, came over, turn of the last century, oh two, oh five, mm -hmm. and you know, learned English, you know, leaving uh, Naples, <laughs> and on the boat to Ellis Island, coming across, and you know, started started from scratch. Yeah, my my grandfather was from Naples, and my grandmother was from Abruzzi region, and back. She never wanted to go back to Italy because they had the earthquake there mm. and it was devastation and she was frightened mm. and she, she wanted to be American. She wanted to kind of drop the accent. She did speak Italian in the house. Mm. My mom didn't pick it up. Very rarely did my, my father's, I mean, my brother, my mother's brothers speak it, but. Mm -hmm. so. Let's see, Sarah, how about Julia Louise Dreyfus and Hugh Jackman? 
Ooh. That's an interesting combination. That is I an would interesting. not have paired those two together in a million years, but that's a very interesting combination. That's, I mean, I love her. She's a man. I love them both. Oh, wait, it's that's um, Seinfeld. Of Julie course. Wright. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, it took me a little She's delayed amazing. on that one. She's amazing. And you know what? I, I know where you're coming from. People you would say a few things about my, sometimes like my little quirkiness. I could break mm. out and dance anytime. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could do the famous stuff. Seinfeld. <laughs> but she could, she could do Nothing. serious. I think she could be serious too. Yeah, oh, oh yeah, mm -hmm. no, she's a she's an amazing actress. She's amazing. She has, I think she has a a, a lilt uh, that can go either way. She could be comedic. Uh, obviously, she has a wide range. She's a. That is that's a good a, one. That's some good. Keep it going, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Throw it out. Of, but we need a hit actor oh. and a mid young a young <laughs> yeah. one. So. Yeah. Marge so, Marge says, interesting that your guardian angel was from Atlanta. Uh, the feminine version of the word Atlantic maybe isn't the boat on a water emptying into the Atlantic. Wow, that's heavy duty. Can that's, we fit that in the subtitle somewhere? Right, right, right. <laughs> Very Work good. That into a title card on a black screen. That, that's interesting. Wow. Joe George. So I thought at first, Joe Joseph is Mark's, um, that's his father's name is Giuseppe or, or Joseph or, and um, his grandfather. And, and then George is my father's grandfather. So we were thinking that maybe the grandpas were up there kind of guiding the way too. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're getting new inf some, yeah, more yeah, information. some more information. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. This is good. Okay. More connections. So um, who else did we think? We threw somebody threw around uh, a Jennifer Gardner or Gardner. Gardner. Um, you know, somebody says, "Oh, I like," you know, Julia Roberts. So I like, and I don't know. You know, I I, I think we're gonna know when we know. Yeah. And and if we're lucky enough, and they they want to do the project, and it'll be some that soulful thread. Um, do you want to say anything else? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Not for the time no. okay. Okay. so put it this way it's a it's a standby yeah and there's yeah. i mean as far as as far as shooting there's so many places i mean not just in in montauk but around on the east end there's places like this this Deerfield drive and water mill and you know you have like it's almost picturesque with the little waterway and there's just so many little like little inlets like um 10 15 minutes from Montauk you know bay beaches and there's so many different settings like you have Shelter Island in the background and Sag Harbor down by the Bay Street, so it's like you know, it's locations galore. <laughs> I agree. I think coming out here, kind of really looking at it and kind of journeying around with Mark and Geraldine the first time, uh, I was confused as to how I haven't seen a film made out here. Like, I was just kind of going, I was racking my brain, going, Have I seen a film that was based in? Montauk and use visual elements and I couldn't come up with anything. I was like, how is that possible? The um, um, The sun sunspots of the spotless mind the Jim Carrey film, right? That was sure. that was Montauk. Okay, and uh, um, The one with um, oh shoot Spotless mind but no, they use that very the much in like they use the house. Is that the house they used in the spotless mind? I think mm -hmm. that breakdown of the house on the beach, I guess. Diane Keaton and something about something's got to give. That was East Hampton, yeah, right. with um, yeah. with with Jack Nicholson. Right. That actually on Newtown Lane when they were, they closed down Newtown Lane for a little while when they shot that. That was like back in two thousand three. Oh, and of course they. They shot the exteriors for Pollock about Jackson Pollock in uh, yeah. Springs. Yeah. They used the, I remember uh, Helen Harrison was telling me about when they were filming that. Yeah. 
something you just thank you for saying that because an artist who is also a TV host, Mark and I are going to be on the Hello Hello show with Chaim mm -hmm. Basarahi. He's like the we, designer last name. Wednesday mornings, I think, seven o'clock. That's on. Right. So, all oh, right. So we're going to be um, being interviewed on Friday, and then I guess he'll use the the, the time. So we have Wednesday. we have some more. Um, let's see. Marge says, "Girl, girlish, playful, vulnerable woman like Sandra Bullock or Amy Schumer." Yeah. And then let's see. Sarah says, "Perhaps Kate Winslet." That's a good, a nice choice. If she's willing to go brunette. Great. She's beautiful. I love her. She's great. We have a question. What what will a second book be about? Oh, good question. So it is in the work of like in mental files, physical files. Um, it's really a, another adventure. So it's going to have the same tone. And of course, I still believe in my faith. <laughs> so it'll be an, an extension of um, where I was when I started writing the book into the present time. But some more miraculous things have happened. And uh, I think they're very much uh, worthy to write and share. And I want to continue the, the, the tone of hope, you know, and that through line of don't give up. And, um, and I have a lot of fun stories. And I'll go back again in time and then into the present, probably, I think it was Grishma you asked the question, to express myself even better. I couldn't, when you read the book, you'll understand where I'm coming from. Um, there are things that I'm able to kind of have a stronger voice around uh, a healing, uh, a, a magic, another blessing just to be here. And so that'll be expressed in, in the second book. And then I have to see where that goes. I, I, I would love to do a children's book. I, I want Geraldina to be like a Matilda, you know, she's got a, she's got a story to tell. <laughs> would you see that as like a pop-up book or a board book or just like um, a, a picture book perhaps? I'm going to throw a name out that, I love him and he knows it. Uh, his name is Peter Reynolds and Susan Verdi just did a bunch of series of books where she wrote the book and uh, it's a children's book and he did the illustrations. There's a story about how I met him in this book in the Geraldine and the Compass Rose. I met Peter in Boston and um, he's a fantastic illustrator. We're going to ask if he wants to do our storyboards because and then eventually maybe that's where the collaboration could go to bring that kind of, you know, he, he understands it all. I, I don't know, I already, we already connected in that, in that miraculous way. And it's a crazy story on how I met him. <laughs> we were at the gala for the Rose Kennedy Greenway opening and an entire table was sitting and he was sitting in the table and I was the, the general manager at Faneuil Hall Marketplace. And I was one of the guests that got to sit at this nice table and they didn't have enough room for me and the maitre d' was mortified because the mayor was about to start and I had to get seated. And I don't know what he said, the entire table, the maitre d' went over, the entire table got up and left, except for this one man. And they tell me I can go to the t table and then the mayor starts the whole, the whole program. And I turn and I look at the program, you know, the one they put on your table, and there's a picture of a man and I look at him and I'm like, is that you? <laughs> so he was the honorary guest because he wrote the book, The Rose Garden after Rose Kennedy. And they had the Jumbotron up there and he animated, they made a, a film, a kid's film out of it. And he literally ripped the program. We start talking and he drew a picture of me watering a plant. And he says, um, let your something shine and let's continue to connect the dots and he wrote a very famous book every teacher in america has it in their in their classroom it's called the dot so peter reynolds the dot susan verdi i was hoping maybe um somewhere down the road he, he can make some sketches for us so we'll see where that goes that would be wonderful thank you for that question all your questions 
And can I um, tell you just to go to my website if you would like to keep in touch with me? Um, I could put it, the uh, link right in the chat here. Excellent. So that's where you're going to get some updates. My CMO, which is my husband, and now I'm going to ask him to come on oh, to no. say hello. Come on. Come on, Mark. Say hello. It's time. He's. I was playing he's the foolish. husband. During this <laughs> he's, he's actually the real husband. He's the real husband. Oh, oh my gosh. Husband, say Mark. hello. There he is. Hello. Here's my cue. <laughs> So thank you so much for joining us, and um, there's, there's more to follow, and you have anything you'd like to add? I think you're doing a great job. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, we'll keep you posted on, in the, on the whereabouts of Auntie in the screenplay, and yes. who's going to play, and if you have any ideas, you know, share it with your friends, and of course, if you could support, find the book, you can find it wherever you'd like to uh, purchase. I don't, I'm not one to tell you where to go. And if you want a signed copy, text me, and I'd be more than happy to mail one out to you, um, and we can talk about how all that goes down. And I have beautiful bookmarks that have roses all over it. Nice. That will <laughs> Great. come with a gift. Okay? Thank you, Steve, and the East Hampton Library. And Thank you. Thank you for, right for conducting this, uh, this wonderful talk. Um, looking forward to... Um, many 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 more books and films and uh I have auntie question. best of luck with Thank with you. the screenplay and um i'm sure it'll be it'll be on released opening weekend on 500 screens uh, oh. <laughs> i hope so Cross fingers on that. steve here's the god's ears. <laughs> all right here's the that. question i'm gonna leave you with who's gonna play you in the movie <laughs> I probably uh, hmm, who would play if, if, if someone was no, uh, no I'm probably <laughs> um probably somebody somebody like Ray like a Ray Romano probably or you know oh, some someone you know Who's uh, had to come up with great casting choices all around? I'll say that. <laughs> I thank you and um, all the best. Thank you very much. Same to everybody. Bye bye, bye, -bye. now.